Harry Mason's relationship to his daughter touches on many themes, single fatherhood, adoption, unconditional love, and estrangement to include a few. Harry lost his wife, Joni Mason, to a disease before the events of the game, solidifying a past and certain tragedy. His grief of his wife's death is explicitly stated as one of the reasons he brought Cheryl back to Silent Hill. He and his wife adopted Cheryl and gave her that name, but he doesn't mention she is adopted until later in the game, showing his love for Cheryl. This love is unconditional to the point that when he learns of her unnerving origins, he is literally willing to plunge into hell to save her. This is known in literature as catabasis. And as the player learns, Harry is estranged from his daughter from the very beginning of the game to the very end. This is sure to evoke separation anxiety in any human being, especially a father mourning the loss of his wife. This is where I must critique Christoph Gans, the director of the 2006 film adaptation of Silent Hill. Gans stated his rationale for changing the role for Harry Mason from a father to a mother in a documentary interview, Path of Darkness, making Silent Hill. Quote, The main theme of the film is motherhood. Who is a good mother? Who is a bad mother? The lead character of Silent Hill 1 is a man named Harry Mason, and he worked very well in the game. But when we started writing respecting his personality, we found that it's a woman. I don't think it's important if the main character is wearing a dress or pants. What is important is that we preserve the atmosphere of the game, which is the most important thing. Though Christoph Gantz made a valiant effort to imbue Silent Hill with feminism, he missed one key element of feminist critique, essentialism. Feminism is not aimed at ending masculinity, contrary to popular belief. As a theory, it is opposed to toxic masculinity as a subcomponent of patriarchal worldview. This implementation and depiction of women as caretakers is typically called an essentialist view of genders in the mother role, which can sometimes be just as egregious in feminist theory as patriarchy or toxic masculinity. It's common for someone unfamiliar with gender topics to think the way to address the gender gap is to simply inverse the so-called roles of each gender, but this still forces a binary depiction of gender, where there doesn't need to be one. But Gans wasn't even doing this, he actually reinforced gender essentialism by putting Rose in the place of Harry Mason. This is a result of thinking there is a fixed essence inherent in women. Judith Butler asserts that this mistake is the result of perpetuations of particular phenomenology and that focusing so much on biological sex as a gendered motivation or behavior is somehow an inherent indicator of one's agency. Okay, that's a lot of jargon, so let me put this in simpler terms. Since we are brought up in a hegemonic society, a society with pre-packaged beliefs regarding gender, free from competing worldviews beyond disparate subcultures, we make assumptions about the motivations and capabilities of people based on their sex. But this does not hold water when we think of the diversity in opinions that spans across expectations of certain genders. Silent Hill the Game also explores the inverse of essentialism as opposed to Gans' film. The game did better work in adapting feminist thought in this way. For one, Sybil Bennett's role as the visiting police officer and expositional voice is clearly a role men typically occupy, ignoring the Resident Evil crossover. What's more, it would have been so tempting to simply mold her into a heroine, but this essentialist role reversal did not come to pass. Although her role as an empowered woman seems troubled by her possession later in the game, we have to keep in mind that the primary plot is between Harry and Cheryl. Sybil did not lose her agency to become a damsel. She was merely abducted, presumably by another woman, Dahlia Gillespie, and the overall powers of the town, which are feminine at this point in time. Speaking of Dahlia, a crone and witch of the story, Dahlia is clearly evil, but not merely in the black magic wielding, wicked witch sense. Dahlia is a hopelessly abusive parent, both emotionally and physically. This role, although coupled with the tired cliché of the crone, actually troubles essentialist notions regarding child abuse. In fact, the whole game can be said to be an allegory about how an adoptive parent or caseworker goes through trials and tribulations to liberate a child from their abusive biological parents. 
Rather than showing pride in her daughter's psychic abilities, Dahlia thinks of ways to use them to her own benefit. She is deeply interested in power and is not only manipulative to Alessa, but to everyone in her path. She successfully deceives her cult subordinates, Harry, Sybil, and Dr. Kaufman. Dahlia isn't a mere crone. She is a megalomaniacal psychopath that is somehow able to influence anyone who comes around her. This is another plotline I'd prefer Gans had left alone, because the original story gave us something to learn from. Gans, Dahlia, merely winds up becoming a sad trunk and imparting no challenging motif to contend with. I think it's easy to forget that Dahlia is Alessa's mother, in both the game and the film, but at least in the game the relationship is made clear towards the end. Dahlia is shown to be indifferent to Alessa's wishes. She has an agenda and would prefer Alessa cooperated, and we witness the results of Alessa's unwillingness to cooperate with her. Alessa's nightmares possess the entire town as an allegory for what it's like to live in an abusive household. The game's intro actually hints at this from the outset, and little set pieces throughout, such as Alessa's school desk. Despite all this, Alessa may seem like the worn damsel in distress motif, but she is portraying a disfigured youth who went on to live through her willpower alone and a child's mentality. She is empowered with psychic abilities, but she had no chance to mature beyond the maiden visage in Jungian archetypal depictions of occult knowledge. We see that her actions through the game have been her projecting herself around the town, attempting to find a way to break her mother's spell. Of course, this part of the game is somewhat lost on the player, but it is implied each time Alessa is mentioned. She has agency, albeit silent and disembodied. Cheryl is also a projection of her power, as a living and breathing manifestation of what innocence was robbed from her physically and spiritually. These themes were disrupted in Gan's film, which was an unfortunate turn of events since so many people see the film as an informative take on the canon, but this is simply not accurate, and it also obfuscates many key points in the game. Essentialism is the source of this confusion. By attempting to correct a problem that wasn't there, the film backfired as it also failed to illustrate positive masculinity. Okay, so we discussed the problem of essentialism, and what this means for women and the non-binary, but let's move on to examine how the essentialists and hegemonic worldview inhibits positive masculinity. First, how is positive masculinity different from toxic masculinity? What are the preconceptions that inform toxic masculine behavior? Let me just put this in my own terms, as getting bogged down in theory can detract us from the central emotive points of this argument. The traits we associate with masculinity invariably equate to something violent and brutish. Basically, the man in the Western family is meant to appear outspoken and unbothered by open displays of emotion, especially from boys. The traditional father role is often coupled with images of the folkloric breadwinner who spends all day at work and comes home just in time for dinner. This father hears the tidings of the family at the dinner table and weighs in on the various moral and procedural topics. He is also one who will not tolerate excuses or backtalk should something fall out of place. This father figure becomes toxic if something happens to rouse his anger. And then there are the skeletons of repressed feelings that eventually overflow because he is incapable of containing all this pent up frustration and emotion. This is the household patriarch. The toxic masculine figure is not far from this patriarch model, but the toxic masculine man is even more imposing and manipulative. They are more emotional than they care to admit, but unfortunately they channel this emotion through anger since this is the only emotion other men accept from their peers. Emotions such as love, compassion, remorse, and guilt are never accepted in a group of men. A boy is only allowed to admit to his mother that he misses her and wants to hug her. A husband is only allowed to express his romantic feelings to a significant other. And remorse and guilt are reserved for the church, another icon of hegemony. Or they take these emotions to the grave. The toxic masculine figure, though says otherwise, does not tolerate open debate on topics regarding religion, patriotism, and sexuality. Any debate ideally ends in his victory over his opponent, since he sees all dialogue as a competition of zero sum and zero risk. Somehow, somewhere down the line, expressly criminal behavior, such as sexual assault, has been openly embraced by the toxic masculine. 
In the past, such behavior was treated as taboo in the mainstream and even among subcultures. But these days, open and targeted hate speech and threats of sexual violence against women has become all too common, especially in gaming culture. Toxic masculinity may seem like a buzzword, but it is a real phenomenon, and many proponents of the term insist on using it because it evokes an appropriate sense of disgust and disapproval. To contrast, positive masculinity says that expressing one's emotions is perfectly fine. Masculinity is not equated with violence and rash behavior. Positive masculinity promotes progressively working through emotional hardships rather than trying to repress them. The positive masculine figure is willing to hear people out on their opinions and is generally more collaborative. Hegemony is not a central marker to their identity, for instance, patriotism and nativism. This means they are not emotionally attached to their homeland to the point that they would engage in verbal or physical confrontation. But this also means they are amenable to concepts and ideas that might originate from other households or cultures entirely. And the irony of this patriarchal figure is that it is their very way of life that has broken up homes. It is their very inability to communicate emotions empathetically that has contributed to family separation. Harry Mason is a bit one-dimensional in the game when it comes to his lines, but this is the fault of some limitations of early game development. If we want to assess his conduct as a father, we have to include verbal as well as non-verbal communication in the game. One could say the entire game is a case study on Harry Mason's conduct as a father. One bit of framework I would like to include here is the Japanese concept of Ikuji. Ikuji is the topic of child rearing in Japan. Iku is the character that means to grow. Ko, which is rendered G in this combination, is one of the kanji for child. The Japanese sociologist Azuma Hiroshi asserts that, quote, contrary to popular belief in the West, Japanese parents rarely discipline their children in an authoritative manner or punish them harshly in order to force them to be obedient, unquote. And what this really means is that Japanese parents are less prone to getting into open confrontation with their children. What's more, child rearing is equated with something called Shinto, which has been translated as seat down or osmosis. The idea, Azuma says, is that a parent leads by example and not by extensive linguistic explanation. With this in mind, we can see why Harry Mason is the perfect show don't tell protagonist. He is a father who shows his love for his daughter through Kamansuru, which is a Japanese phrase that means to endure. Gamansuru is carrying on in silent determination despite one's personal hardships. At first glance, Gaman just means patience, but the characters contain more nuance. First character is read Ware, which is an old personal pronoun for the self, and the second character Osoi means to be slow. The person who can Gamansuru moves slowly, which is interpreted as methodically to their goal. This trait is a ubiquitous virtue in Japanese society, and in this, Harry Mason excels. He shows us that the positive masculine figure endures hardship with little protest. He faces his challenges as they come, and he knows he can work through his problems best when he has a clear mind. The protective instincts Harry displays are not rooted in the over-masculine need to be a hero. He is not flaunting affectation as if he were some sort of superhero. We can contrast this with Dr. Kaufman, who is clearly aggressive to the point of verbal assault, getting into physical scuffles, and firing his gun at whoever he comes across. And while Gamansuru seems to mirror Western Stoicism, it is merely a trait that can be coupled with any form of conduct. You can Gamansuru and be a generous person, or you can Gamansuru and be a callous person. What's important is that we follow the context clues rather than the verbal speech. My image of a positive masculine person is one that is capable of enduring hardship without making it everyone else's problem, but at the same time, they are capable of sharing their emotions and confiding in friends without feeling insecure about it. As a man, I find it is crucial that we teach positive masculinity 
and I think Harry Mason is a great example to point towards. There are few positive masculine protagonists in fiction, and in games, there is often a mistake that a particular protagonist is a model for positive masculinity, even among feminists, while they are actually projections of toxic masculinity. For adjacent examples, James Sunderland or Joel from The Last of Us. It was tempting to write a contrasting analysis of Harry and James, but then I realized that that would be a whole other presentation of its own. So if you would like to see that, please let me know in the comments below. Anyways, I hope this all made sense to you viewers out there. Let me know if you agree with my analysis. Thank you for listening, and until next time.